Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you here to this program um, uh, hosted by the Center for Studies in Higher Education. I'm Carol Christ, and I'm the director. And I am so delighted to welcome Nathan Brostrom back to campus and to talk to us about the system-wide budget. I suppose this close to the big game, I shouldn't start this introduction by saying that Nathan went to Stanford, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> but then he went to Princeton, <laughs> to the Woodrow Wilson School. And uh, before he came to Berkeley to be the Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services, he worked both for J.P. Morgan and for the California uh, State Department of the Treasury, um, both in the areas of public finance, and then he jumped to the other side of the desk and came here and was our Vice Chancellor. O.P. saw um, his extraordinary talent, intelligence, and imagination, so hired him to be there. Um, uh, Vice President for Administration, and he is now, has a much bigger title than that. He's Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer for the University of California. And um, I'm so thrilled to welcome him here and to, uh, to be able to host this presentation today. So welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much, Carol. Carol was uh, actually the, the provost when we first uh, uh, came to Berkeley because my connection with, uh, with UC uh, preceded my, my time coming here. Um, actually, my first wife and I met at Stanford, so you can boo and, boo and, boo and hiss. Uh, but uh, she went on to get her PhD at, at UCLA, and then she uh, came up here and was a uh, professor of psychology. And uh, 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 Carol was the uh, uh, provost, and Bob Berdahl was the, uh, was the chancellor. She unfortunately uh, passed away quite young. Uh, but that was actually one of the things that really cemented my, um, uh, my relationship and, and sentiment towards the, uh, towards the campus was uh, just the outpouring of affection and support we got uh, from the whole campus, but especially the, uh, uh, the psychology department. And, uh, and it's, you know, we have six kids and they are all uh, loyal bears. In fact, uh, we moved up here in 90, uh, 96 and uh, uh, our son, uh, David, who was just two years old at the time, uh, he is now in, now in college, but um, uh, he had the chance to meet uh, President Clinton, who was running for re-election, and all week long he practiced, um, hello, President Clinton, hello, President Clinton, hello, <laughs> President Clinton. And then we got to the event, and uh, he saw President Clinton, and he froze, and he said the first thing that came to his mind, go Bears! <laughs> <laughs> and of course, President Clinton, being President Clinton, was like, oh yeah, the Bears, look at the Bears. So. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk um, uh, uh, today about... Uh, how we uh, uh, create and sustain a, uh, a solid and sustainable uh, uh, financial model. Um, I, do, I use both, um, uh, both terms deliberately, uh, solid and sustainable, because we're trying to build a financial model that supports uh, this generation of students, the, the cohort of students who are here now, but also one that, um, uh, that is sustainable. Uh, you know, the uh, university is approaching its 150th um, uh, uh, anniversary, and we are just stewards of it for a, a period of time. So we want um, uh, a, a financial model that will um, uh, work for uh, you know, CFOs 20, 40, 60 years from now. Um, and also, it's a small enough group. So if there are things that don't make sense, um, uh, please raise your hand or ask questions. Or um, uh, you know, I'd like, love this to be inter interactive. Uh, you know, our, our financial model is really grounded in the three, uh, the three values that we uh, hold dearly across uh, UC, quality, access, and affordability. And I, um, I know this is well known to um, uh, many of you, but I'll just spend a, a few uh, minutes of it on each. Oh, I, I should say, um, I'm also going to be talking about it from a system-wide perspective. Um, there's room up here, Panos. Um, I'm going to be talking about it from a system-wide perspective. So a lot of the data and a lot of the things you'll see are in the aggregate. And so there are things that will uh, you know, make sense for one campus that may not make sense for another campus. So you know, medical centers are a very good example. Uh, medical centers are supporting us a great deal, but obviously there, there's only on, um, uh, on five of the campuses. So quality, I think uh, everyone knows about the, uh, uh, the quality of uh, UC Berkeley. It is a top uh, public university in the country. I think it's 17 or 18 years straight in US News and World Report. But, you know, across the world, it is uh, typically ranked in the top five in, um, uh, in, in universities worldwide, whether it's uh, Shanghai Zhaodong or the Times of London or, or, or Washington Monthly. Uh, but we enjoy similar quality and, and a breadth of quality across the UC system. 
Uh, one measure of it, uh, there are 62 AAU institutions, Association of American Universities, 62 in the United States and, and Canada. Six of them are UC campuses. And that doesn't even include uh, UCSF, which is one of the top, um, you know, top five medical schools in the, uh, uh, in the country. No other uh, state system has more than, um, uh, more than two. So it's really remarkable that we have this, um, uh, this breadth of, uh, of quality. But we also do that by, by uh, remaining accessible to all Californians. In this fall, 42% uh, of our undergraduates across the whole system, 42% are Pell Grant recipients, uh, coming from uh, the lowest income brackets in, um, uh, in, in California. About 40% are first generation, first in their families uh, to ever go to um, uh, college. Uh, and that's really remarkable. If you look at you know, who we uh, compete with, if you look at Stanford or Princeton, it's you know, I just got the news, I was down at Stanford a couple weeks ago and President Hennessy was talking about the 14% uh, first generation. Um, and uh, uh, so it, it's an order of magnitude um, uh, uh, higher. It's also one that's been growing. I didn't, I didn't realize this till a couple weeks ago, but in 1999, uh, the number of first generation uh, students was 19%. So even during the throes of all the financial troubles we've gone through, we've actually uh, increased our access to, uh, to low income. And then we're also affordable. And I would say we're affordable on a, on a gross basis. I mean, our overall tuition is very low, but especially on a net basis, 55% uh, of our students, undergraduates, pay no tuition at all. 55% pay no tuition. About half the students uh, have no debt. And those that do take on debt graduate with uh, about $10,000 uh, less than, the, um, than, the, than the, the national average. But everything we do on a financial model has to be driven by these values and has to fit into one where we're not compromising access to, to maintain quality or, um, uh, or uh, the trade-off between affordability and, and access. I don't know if all of you saw this, but it's really nice to get external validation on, uh, on some of these things. And this was actually in the, um, uh, the New York Times uh, two months ago. It actually was uh, during a Regents meeting, which was uh, uh, quite helpful to be able to point out. This is really a, a measure of, um, of, of both uh, economic diversity and social mobility across uh, all of the um, uh, uh, campuses. So it looks at the number of uh, Pell students and it also looks at affordability for a middle class uh, uh, cohort. Uh, how much it costs if you are, I think, I think it's $150,000 in, uh, in family in, in income and, then it, and it comes up with an index. Of all the universities in the, uh, in the United States, six of the top seven are UC uh, campuses. And they do have a gating threshold, which is you have to have a graduation rate, a five-year graduation rate of 75%. If they didn't have that, we would have been nine of the top 10. Because Merced, uh, Santa Cruz, and Riverside are all, in the, uh, are all highest in terms of, um, uh, of, uh, of Pell Grant recipients. Um, I would also like to you know, point out a couple of other things on this, um, uh, on this chart, which we're really proud of. Um, you, know, you look at some of these schools that do make the top 10, Pomona, Amherst, Vassar, do a very good job. You know, they um, uh, enroll a lot of low-income students, but they do it in the hundreds. So Pomona's you know, 400, Amherst is just below uh, uh, 500. Across the UC system, we have 80,000 80, Pell Grant recipients. And so when you think of the, the transformational impact that has not only on the student and their family, but also on the whole state of California, it's just a, it's just a different uh, level of magnitude. Um, I would point out this because this is the more sobering part of it. They, uh, he also r uh, runs a per student endowment. Uh, and uh, this is going to you know, come up later in the, in, in the talk. But if you, if you look at it, UC Irvine, which is the top, has $11,000 endowment uh, per student. Uh, Pomona, number 10, 100 times more, $1.1 million. And when you think about the strength and the resilience of a, um, uh, of a financial um, uh, model, this becomes a really big, um, a big factor for universities. So um, the, the, the strategy that I have put together that I, I talk about has four basic uh, quadrants. Uh, one is we need to have predictable state funding. Uh, we also need to have a predictable and, and moderate uh, uh, tuition plan. Uh, but those in and of themselves are not going to sustain the, uh, the excellence and the access to UC. Uh, instead, we also have to do everything we can to generate um, uh, alternative revenues within, uh, within the system 
and we also have to um, uh, look at everything we do from an administrative standpoint and, and reduce those costs. And then I have, um, I, I put this on the bottom because I think this is one thing we have not done that effectively is, is leveraging our balance sheet. Uh, and I don't think this is just UC, I think this is public higher education in, in, in general. So we've always thought of ourselves sort of as a, um, an income statement or a P&L uh, organization. You know, how much revenue do we have coming in from the state? How much from tuition? What are our expenses? Are we in the, in the red or the black? Um, and then we go on from there. Well, we have, a, you know, we have a very robust balance sheet. We have $90 billion of assets. Now we have huge unfunded liabilities as well, but um, uh, there are lots of things that we can be doing here to both uh, reduce our costs and also generate more revenues. And I'll, I'll talk about those um, uh, a little bit later. So l let me start with predictable um, uh, state funding and, and the, um, uh, the moderate uh, uh, tuition plan. Um, I think this is um, you know, fairly well known to, known to people, but um, uh, you know, what's really happened in the, in the ta past 25 years is that the uh, UC has been uh, increasingly crowded out of, of, of state funding. If you look at where we are today versus where we were in 1989-90, and these are in absolute dollars, these aren't inflation adjusted, uh, we are exactly the same. Exactly the same in absolute funding as we were uh, 17 years ago, when we have you know, grown 80,000 80, students, we added uh, a campus, scores of new programs and, um, um, uh, and, and degrees. Um, and you know, this is not really out of, out of uh, uh, neglect or malice by um, uh, Sacramento. There's a little bit of that, I will admit. But uh, uh, more of it is just the, 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 the structure of the state budget on both the revenue side and on the, um, uh, and on the expenditure side. So on the revenue side, uh, I was, as, as Carol mentioned, I was a public finance banker. And when we work with, with states, what you really wanted to see was a revenue structure that had about a third, a third, a third in the different um, uh, buckets. So a third in income tax, a third in property tax, a third in, um, uh, a third in sales tax. Uh, in the state of California right now, any guesses is how much in uh, income tax? Two thirds. Two thirds of the state's revenue come from income tax. And because of the way we're structured, a lot of that is in the highest brackets. A lot of that is in, in capital gains. And so just by the nature of it, property tax and sales tax are much less volatile. They're much more, more stable. Uh, we just have an incredibly volatile um, uh, uh, revenue structure. And then on the expenditure side, you know, we're in a state that just loves to, um, uh, loves to budget by the ballot box. And so we have Prop 98, which says a certain amount of the revenue has to go to K through 14. We have federal mandates. We have you know, the, the, the courts taking over our, our prison system. And so the UC is part of an increasingly dwindling uh, part of the state budget uh, that's truly discretionary. You know, by some estimates, it's as low as 20 to 25 percent. And so uh, when we get, um, uh, you know, when, when, we're, when the state's uh, going through revenue cuts, we're the first ones to get cut. And then as we found out in the last few years, because of Prop 98, we don't really get restored that, that much. Um, you know, as, as, um, as much as the legislature wanted to give us money, there just really wasn't a lot because of the, the 98. So I think, you know, in, in some ways, I think the best we can do is to hope for predictable and, uh, and moderate uh, uh, state growth. I mean, I think we should, you know, look at other possibilities and possibly a dedicated revenue stream or, or uh, um, other opportunities. But I don't think that um, uh, I don't think our salvation is going to come from um, uh, from from the state. At the same time, we've passed on um, uh, the volatility that uh, we see from the state. We pass it on in, in tuition. And so, if you look at the last uh, 20 years, uh, there were 11 years, uh, including the current uh, the six that we are currently in, where tuition was either flat or um, or declining. Uh, there were six years where it was double digit, uh, and only three years where it grew roughly by the, uh, by the rate of inflation. And I think this is a terrible, terrible policy. I think it's terrible for our students and our families. If you're a student at UC, depending on when you came, your tuition could have doubled during that time, or it could have been flat through no me measure of your own. But it's also not fair to campus leadership. Uh, campuses do not know uh, what they're going to have uh, for long-term planning. And if, and if anything, a university needs to plan for, uh, for long-term uh, growth. So I would, um, uh, I, I would posit that a much better policy would just be to uh, tell an incoming student, your tuition is going to grow roughly by the rate of inflation uh, over, your, uh, over your time here. 
And then this is the, um, uh, this is the net outcome of, um, uh, of what we've seen. So uh, let me explain. This is the uh, amount on a per student inflation adjusted basis we get from the state of California. This is the amount from uh, tuition and fees. And this is the amount from uh, UC general funds, which includes non-resident tuition, it includes some indirect cost recovery, uh, it includes a few other um, uh, 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 revenue sources. Uh, so you can see a couple things. First of all, the overall cost of educating a student from core funds has decreased. It's decreased by about 20% uh, percent, uh, over the last 25 years. And this runs, you know, this runs frankly counter to the, the national narrative. If you hear uh, pundits or, or even the president talk you know, the costs of higher education are, are uh, rising out of, out of control. Our costs have actually uh, come down. Now, who's paying has changed dramatically. You know, 1990-91, the state paid 80% of the um, uh, core funds of the, um, uh, of, of the cost of education. Now it's less than, than 40%. So the state portion has been cut in half, and students have, um, uh, have had to pick up more. Though even this has a, a nuance. I mean, remember in, uh, a couple slides ago, I told you that half the students pay no tuition. So half of this green bar is coming from other sources, which includes the federal government, the state, and our own uh, institutional aid. Uh, so it's not quite as uh, uh, dramatic a shift as we uh, point out. And then the other thing that I would just um, uh, preview um, uh, that we have in, in, in further slides is that our actual cost of exp expenditures for education is actually higher than this, but it's coming from non-core sources. So I'll talk about medical uh, centers and how much they put into to medical school. So it's, yeah, I'm sorry, Celeste. So the number there that it says that the cost per student is not actually. This amount. is, yeah, this is the core funds. So this is just, uh, uh, I'll show you a slide that shows what, what those are. But one thing that we're doing, we're trying to do more, is to leverage non-core funds, things like. Yeah, I just wanted to know how much it costs to educate a student from 1990 to 2014. Okay, well, I, I, we, we, did a, we actually did a paper that shows, uh, I, that I, I can send you, that includes all those sources. Uh, but on core funds, this, it, it actually has gone down. So uh, let me tell you about um, uh, what has happened recently with the state, since a lot of um, uh, uh, people are interested in that. One of, the, one of the big changes I was just telling Celeste about is moving from the campus to OP is, I used to work out most mornings with, with Devin Wicks back here, and, have a, have a great workout, and now I work out in downtown Oakland, and one of my gym mates is Governor Brown, which uh, means I often don't get a, much of a workout in because he wants to talk about, uh, uh, he wants to talk all about the, the university. But we spent a lot of time with the governor uh, and his folks um, uh, last year, and uh, you know the governor has very uh, strong and um, strongly held views about the university, and Judd, I understand they go back to his first term as, uh, as, as governor. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think we got a uh, uh, you know pretty good framework uh, from him that was then uh, um, uh, approved in the in the budget that the legislature passed. It would basically be a, a, a base budget increase of four uh, percent each year for the next four years. That totals uh, about five hundred million dollars overall. We also got uh, four hundred thirty-six million dollars in one-time money. This was from uh, Proposition Two uh, that can go into our retirement plan. Um, assuming an introduction of a, uh, of a new tier with, a, um, uh, with a, the, the same cap, the income cap that the state has. Uh, we agreed to hold uh, in-state tuition flat for two years. Again, I didn't agree with that, but I think uh, it was part of getting this deal done. And then we would have uh, what we were looking for is just moderate uh, inflation that's generally pegged to uh, uh, inflation. Uh, there would be tuition increases for non-resident and um, uh, professional degree programs. Uh, and then more one-time money for deferred maintenance and, uh, and, and cap and trade. And then finally, this was not part of the budget framework, but at the, um, uh, the legislature put in uh, this contingent enrollment funding. So if we uh, can demonstrate that we will enroll 5,000 more California undergraduates in 16, 17, over 14, 15, uh, we'll get $25 million um, in, the, um, uh, in the base budget. And this is something I don't want to uh, give away the president's, I guess she's already said it, so we are going we, we to try to do it. We're going to try to do it uh, through the uh, $25 million, plus we're going to phase out um, uh, institutional aid for non-resident um, uh, students, and that will give us the, the funds to um, uh, get the, the $10,000 per, per student. Any, any questions on that? or? What's a one question? The, the picture you showed for system-wide, there's, there's a rough balance between income from tuition and, and what we're getting from the state. 
but I think Berkeley's the pattern here is rather different because we get much more from tuition than we do from uh, from the state. I mean, it's about three to one ratio. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how is these sort of inter-campus differences factored into um, the negotiations between the governor and the president? Have those been taken, differences been taken into account? Yeah, um, they have been taken into account. Um, I will say I don't think any, any single campus was particularly happy uh, <laughs> with, uh, uh, but, they, but, you're, but, but you're right, Steve, they're, they're, they, it, it does vary uh, quite a bit. I mean, I think Berkeley, for example, benefited from the increases in non-resident uh, 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 tuition, um, but then the, uh, the president has decided to uh, accelerate what we call rebenching, which is ensuring that all of the uh, state funds is, are allocated on a weighted, equal weighted uh, per student uh, basis. And so that, that didn't hurt Berkeley as much as it hurt like uh, UCLA. Um, so there were, you know, there were uh, puts and takes on, on, on all, the, all the campuses. Um, but I think Berkeley particularly um, uh, was hurt by not having the in-state tuition because, you know, especially without a, without a medical center, uh, it doesn't have some of the other uh, revenue sources that um, some of the other uh, higher ranked UCs had. Um, we did um, uh, work a lot on some different uh, delivery initiatives, and um, you know this. I have to say, the governor is very, very focused on. I think these are all very positive. Um, uh, you know, at the at the end of the day, we are looking at ways to streamline uh, transfers to get to um, uh, the two to one ratio, two freshmen for every one transfer at all the the campuses, and also take uh, transfers from a, a wider uh, array of uh, uh, community colleges. Uh, right now. About 90% of our, our transfers come from 25 community colleges, and there are 100 and, 107 around the, uh, uh, around the state. Um, lots that we can do. I mean, we do a very good job on time to degree and graduation rates, but I think there's even more uh, that we can do. And um, uh, you know, a lot that are, are looking at curricular requirements and uh, a better use of uh, summer sessions to to uh, keep kids moving through. And then there's a lot of really fascinating things going on um, uh, in predictive analytics. And I'm sure many of you know about uh, these more than I do, but just um, being able to uh, uh, predict student outcomes and help students when they are, are falling short in either courses or, uh, or towards, their, um, uh, you know, or towards their, their time to degree. Uh, and so that is something that's going on across all of the, uh, the different campuses and I think should um, uh, you know, produce some pretty uh, favorable outcomes. What yeah. is activity-based costing? Oh, I knew someone was going to see that now. <laughs> uh, this is a particular um, uh, interest of the, um, uh, of the governor. There is a, uh, I think he's an economist down at, at Stanford named Bill Massey. And he's written a book about activity-based costing. It's never actually been done uh, anywhere. Uh, but we are doing a pilot of it at UC Riverside. Uh, in there, it's the, it's the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And really what it's doing is it's looking at all, all of the inputs that go into to teaching a course. And teaching a course, whether it's a seminar, whether it's a large lecture class, whether you know, it's a hybrid, part online, part, uh, part in class. Um, the problem with it is it's, it's never really been tied to learning outcomes. And so no matter what you uh, figure out on the, on the cost side, unless you can tie it to what students are actually learning, I don't think it has much, uh, uh, much value. But we're going through the exercise, and we'll, we'll see what it does uh, show us. Celeste? So I have a question about the other one, the yeah. analytics. So is that what goes under the name of adaptive learning in the document? Some of it's adaptive learning, but some of it's also um, um, you know, just using uh, uh, systems to, to see when a student is, is um, uh, not progressing uh, well. So if a student, let's say, is in a chemistry series and they're in, and they're in, the, first, uh, in the, the first course, but they don't sign up by a certain time, they have a, let's say they have a C and they don't sign up by a certain time, you know just by the breadth of data that it's likely that they they're not going to um, uh, eventually sign up. And that's sort of a trigger then for you know, warm intervention for an advisor or professor to call and say, you know, what's going on? Have you, um, uh, have you been able to, uh, uh, to do this? And um, some of it is, it's probably, um, uh, probably better spent at, at um, uh, uh, places where the students have lower, um, uh, uh, lower academic quality coming in. Uh, you know, we spent some time with um, the president of uh, Arizona State 
and they're using it quite a bit. But he said that you know it's really for students who are not really at Berkeley's kind of uh, of caliber. But it does have you know it does have some um, some value in, in terms of increasing graduation rates and, and reducing time to degree. Okay, so now let me j uh, jump into um, uh, alternative revenues. I actually I wrote some notes down, which. My team always, they, they write notes for me and then I, I you know, always keep this uh, crumpled up. So, um, but again, I think this is really what we're gonna need to, um, uh, to look at to, to um, uh, preserve the, uh, the, the, the quality and the access and affordability of, of uh, the UC system. So Celeste, to your, your question, what I've been talking about so far, the tuition, uh, state general funds, and UC general is really about a quarter of our overall revenue. Um, and that's, you know, that's shrunk quite a bit. Uh, 25 years ago, it, it, it was closer to half of the, the, the revenue pie. The rest of it is made up of you know, the rest of our enterprise, including our, our medical centers. A lot of this is, includes medical payment plans, so that's uh, built in there. Uh, uh, contracts and grants, and then um, uh, auxiliaries and, and uh, uh, private philanthropy. So one of the, uh, the goals that we have is trying to leverage all we can in this 75% to support, uh, uh, to support our core mission, to support the teaching and learning uh, that's going on from our, our, our core revenues. Uh, one of the um, you know, most immediate areas in enrollment management was, uh, was non-resident um, uh, uh, tuition. And we use this quite extensively um, uh, during the, the financial crisis. So, you know, the financial crisis really hit in the fall of, of 2008. And so you can see this was a period of time when we were cut a billion dollars uh, by the state and the percentage of uh, non-residents doubled then, and it has since um, uh, uh, tripled uh, uh, from that time. Um, non-residents, uh, uh, to Steve's question, really fall into to, uh, uh, three buckets. So you know, when I'm at the legislature, I like to point out the 13.6% uh, um, uh, number. But you know, UCLA, Berkeley, and San Diego are all over 20% in terms of the uh, overall population. Uh, Davis, Irvine, and Santa Barbara are all between uh, 10 and 15%. And then Merced, uh, Santa Cruz, and uh, Riverside are all 5% or below. So it really does fall into, uh, into um, uh, different buckets. Uh, and you can see relative to AAU publics or even other flagships uh, that we're still, we're still very low. Um, now, I think one thing that you know, we should take into account is that a lot of these states, uh, you know, uh, Michigan, for example, first of all, they hit uh, financial hard times long before uh, uh, California did, and so they had to. They also don't have uh, uh, a growing cohort of, uh, of high school graduates, and, um, uh, you know, and California does, is that uh, our demand, the demand for uh, UC continues to grow not only because uh, we have a growing population, but because also our completion rates, uh, high school completion rates, are actually increasing quite dramatically, especially among uh, Hispanic Latino uh, students. And so we want to make sure that we maintain, we, we remain accessible uh, to all of these um, uh, graduates. Um, you know, a lot of the attention goes to non-residents, but there are other areas of, of enrollment management that uh, campuses are starting to, um, uh, to look at. Um, you know, one is in the profile of graduate education. Uh, Berkeley uh, produces more PhDs than any university in the, uh, in the country. Uh, but there are a lot of our uh, competitors, you know, Harvard or, or Stanford do a lot with master's programs. A lot of those are, uh, are revenue generating. A lot of those are, um, you know, needed by the, um, uh, by the workforce. So a lot of our campuses are looking at areas where they can expand um, uh, master's programs, even if it means uh, reducing the size of some of the PhD programs. Um, you know, other areas, certificates, uh, uh, ex extension programs. I know Haas uh, has done uh, quite a bit with uh, executive ed and um, uh, other programs like that, and then, and then self-supporting programs that do not uh, draw on the, um, uh, on the state. So all of our campuses are looking at ways where they can use enrollment management to, you know, to sustain academic quality, but also um, uh, do it in a way that's uh, 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 stable revenues. Pat. I want to ask you a question about self-supporting programs. I understand they're increasing at the university. And so to what extent are they increasing costs to students who, before this point, would have had lower cost access to these programs? Uh, that's a good question, and we'd probably have to go through it uh, 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 you know, program by program. Probably the best example of where they went through uh, and did self-supporting was the Anderson School when they went to a self-supporting um, uh, MBA. 
Uh, they have not raised tuition that significantly since then. Um, I'm not actually, I, I'm not convinced that that is, was a good decision. I mean, that, that's a core academic program at the university. Uh, they weren't getting that much state funding anyway, so I'm not sure what the, you know, this declaration, I'm not taking it really, uh, uh, really got them. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, a lot of the self-supporting programs that have arisen have been more on areas that were not being traditionally served. And so they're, they're new programs that are um, uh, uh, arising, but it would probably be, you know, warrant going through each program to see, you know, which ones were, uh, did supplant others and which were uh, truly complementary. And are, are they mostly at the professional level, not on the undergraduate level? They're all at the professional level. Yeah, there's no, no undergraduate, well, I'll say that and then someone will say, yes, they're, <laughs> but yeah, at the, at, all at the professional level. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning, but this has been an area of, of considerable strength. Uh, uh, you know, again, it's been an area of, um, um, you know, that we have to uh, closely monitor. If you can see, the, uh, the medical centers have been increasing both in their, in their revenues, uh, but also in their, in their margins, in their net income. Um, and a lot of this comes back to support our health sciences schools. Uh, so, you know, net income uh, this year, 14-15, uh, was $650 million um, uh, at the medical centers. $400 million of that uh, comes to support the uh, health sciences schools uh, and has been a, you know, huge benefit to, um, uh, uh, to those places, not only directly but also indirectly in terms of facilities, uh, in terms of some joint hires, especially in life sciences and other, um, uh, other areas. But, you know, as Rory uh, knows, um, uh, you know, when I was a banker 15 years ago, we were working with UCLA. UCLA Med Center was down to six days cash on hand. Uh, and they were, you know, they had a sizable loan from the campus to, to the Med Center to, uh, uh, to keep them afloat. Uh, and you know there are there are lots of good things going on in our medical centers. They're actually starting to work much more closely as a uh, as a system. Uh, they're doing a lot of things called leveraging scale for value, where they are taking uh, a lot of the, the advantages that they have as a system. Um, but uh, we're also very dependent on uh, Medicare and Medi-Cal, which is something that we take great pride in. But you know, especially with the exchanges and especially with um, some of the measures of uh, uh, of ACA. Um, you know, the, the reimbursements there are uh, not nearly what they are for uh, commercial payers. And we're competing against, you know, people like Kaiser, which don't just by definition do not take um, uh, Medi-Cal or, um, or they don't take Medi-Cal um, uh, payments. So while this has been a, a, a huge benefit to, uh, uh, oh, and I should also mention, this really only benefits five campuses uh, right now. Uh, because the, you know, the way we have the financial model set up, there is not uh, a lot of, um, uh, uh, cross subsidies uh, to the other um, uh, to the other campuses. But yeah. Are they ruining our healthcare system too? I'm sorry. Aren't they ruining our healthcare system as well? The medical centers. Are you mean UC Care? Yeah. Well, yeah, they're trying. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> we have a. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't heard. Like, all right, never mind. It, no. As, as we understand it, the medical centers are trying to replace other options by a UC um, only healthcare. We do have, we did introduce UC Care, which is a, a PPO uh, that does uh, benefit a lot from the medical uh, uh, centers, but we still have, you know, HealthNet and, uh, you know, HealthNet and Kaiser and all the other, all the other offerings. For now. So, for now. <laughs> yeah. What are the reasons that there are such a discrepancies in growth, uh, profit growth in, uh, in uh, San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Irvine and Davis and not? Uh, well, I, I, bet, I bet Rory can answer that better, but a lot of it is the, is the profile of care. Uh, so um, uh, UCLA and San Diego do a lot of specialty care, a lot of tertiary and quaternary uh, uh, care. Uh, I mean, UCSF does as well. UCSF is constrained here because they, they just brought in the new hospital, and so the debt service uh, from that is taking a big chunk of their out. But you know, UCSF, in terms of their, I guess we don't have it broken down by revenues. Their revenues are, are, are very, very high. Uh, but their, um, their net income is constrained because of the debt service they just started to pay. Yeah. Um, you know, research is another area of huge strength and it's really, uh, uh, you know, sustained a lot of the academic excellence at, at Berkeley and across all of our campuses. Um, and we have uh, been, kept it relatively flat. Um, 
uh, over the years, which is pretty remarkable given federal uh, uh, sequestration. Um, but you know there are some there are some issues. Uh, uh, the first is is the is the decline in, in federal research. So in 1011, just five years ago, it was nearly two thirds of our, um, uh, our our research uh, contracts and grants. 80 percent of that came from NIH and, um, and and NSF. In the most recent year, it was below 60 uh, percent. And one of the problems with that, I mean, first of all, we were able to replace it. We replaced it with foundation uh, grants. Uh, state grants, uh, uh, even corporate grants. One of the big problems with that is those those grants don't pay. Uh, so, state of California, you know, I spent a lot of time wrangling with them about this. Um, you know, Berkeley's indirect cost rate, I think, is 55, 56, uh, 56 rows. Uh, the state of California pays at best 20 cents, yeah. uh, 20 percent. Uh, the Gates Foundation, we get money from the Gates Foundation. They pay 15 percent. And so the more you're, the more you're um, and I won't even say full paying because you know, the federal government's not, not full paying, but the more you're replacing those grants with grants that aren't paying the indirect cost recovery, you're, you are really sapping discretionary revenue from the, uh, from the campuses. Um, and then the other issue is just that our indirect cost rates on the federal rates are still low. Now every campus, uh, and I think Berkeley has really led the way here, has done a good job in, um, in increasing it. I mean, Berkeley has gone up uh, from 53, I think it's 56 uh, uh, next year. UCSF just renegotiated it, but you know, against uh, against Harvard, Yale, Hopkins, you know, we are uh, 12 to 15 points below. And when you think of that on a scale that's five billion dollars, that's tens of millions of dollars of discretionary revenue. So. Um, uh, I think we need to keep uh, working at this, both from a technical basis, but also a political one. I mean, we every time we go back to D.C., we you know we say why is uh, you know why is why is Berkeley uh, uh, 14 points lower than than Harvard? And there's no real good answer. I mean, the answer used to be well, the state built all your buildings. Well, the state hasn't built any buildings in in years for us, so uh, that really doesn't suffice. And and um, uh, but the campuses are also doing a good job of coming up with a better technical analysis. I saw the last one that Berkeley submitted, and that was, that was really, um, uh, really strong. But this is an area where we could be getting you know, tens of millions of dollars of more discretionary revenue um, uh, that, that truly does just flow to the campus. Uh, and this is another area that um, uh, I really want to focus on, because I think it does offer both um, immediate and long-term uh, uh, benefits. Um, you know, we do a fairly good job on, on private philanthropy, especially for a public university. Uh, $1.8 billion um, uh, in fiscal year um, uh, 2014. Um, again, this is largely focused on a few campuses. Uh, UCSF, UCLA, and, and Berkeley are, uh, you know, uh, 1.2 billion uh, of that. And so there's lots of campuses that don't raise much at all. Um, but probably the bigger issue is that so little of it goes to unrestricted um, uh, 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 purposes. And um, you know, that's something as you know, people who, who raise money know it's very, very hard now to get donors to give uh, unrestricted uh, uh, dollars. But there are very, very good models, and our private counterparts use these all the time, where you can take restricted uh, dollars, honor the donor's interests, but then uh, also use them to, um, uh, to support uh, core unrestricted uh, purposes. So uh, you know, when I was at, uh, at the Berkeley campus, we got that great grant from the Hewlett Foundation, $110 million of, um, uh, to match and endowed chairs. And uh, while the, you know, the sum itself was uh, great, what was really great about it was that 75% of the payout, we increased the amount of the payout, uh, and then 75% of that had to go to faculty salaries and graduate student support. And those were uh, previously uh, sources that came from, uh, that came from um, uh, core funds, from uh, you know, the state or, or tuition. We basically cribbed that and did that with, the president did a, a matching, uh, uh, a match for uh, endowed chairs across the, the system. Um, one of the things we, you know, we heard when we were doing this at Berkeley was that donors would see through this, they wouldn't like it. All of these have gone much faster um, uh, than people uh, uh, anticipated. Uh, I think we can do the same thing in, in student financial support. I mean, our, uh, you know, we have $700 million in institutional financial aid, which is great and, and preserves uh, everything we talked about earlier. Uh, but we don't do anything, in, because we do that out of our own tuition, we basically tax our own students, uh, we don't raise that much money for it. And if we could um, uh, use some of that to supplant, that would free up more money for the operating budget. And then also in, in capital financing. Um, 
you know, we have a very low uh, uh, cost of capital and everything we can do to raise uh, gifts for, um, uh, for buildings, but then utilize our, our uh, low cost of debt uh, gives us an uh, inherent um, uh, financial advantage. So that brings us to, to, uh, to the balance sheet and some things I think we can be doing um, uh, more effectively uh, uh, there. Uh, first of all, this is our, this is our debt. This is the, uh, uh, the debt uh, profile of the, um, of the University of California. This purple area is what we call our general revenue debt. This is all we had uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we only had one, uh, one lien. Um, and so this is supported by all the revenues of the, um, uh, of the university. Uh, about 10 years ago, we introduced uh, what's called a limited project revenue bond. This is for uh, projects that have a revenue source. So uh, dormitories, uh, uh, parking structures, uh, anything that can uh, generate its own revenue, we have a, a separate um, uh, uh, lien for. And then finally, we just introduced this about six years ago. Uh, the goldenrod is our academic medical centers. They were growing so big that we, um, we uh, 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 introduced its own, its own credit for the, um, uh, for the medical centers. Um, so I, you know, I would say that we have managed this quite effectively. Our overall cost of capital is 4%. Uh, and that includes uh, quite a bit of uh, taxable debt, so it's not all uh, uh, tax exempt. Uh, one other thing that we did uh, uh, this year um, is we, introduced, we uh, issued um, our second century bond. Uh, a century bond sounds weird, but it is exactly what it sounds like. We issued a bond in 2015 that won't come due till 2115. Uh, and um, it was our second one, so we've issued $1.3 billion uh, uh, of that. The interest rate on that was 4.76%. Uh, uh, and so basically, it's the closest thing that we have to, um, uh, to equity uh, uh, at a university. And what, the reason that it's, it's, it's good, the reason that it's effective is that uh, what we've done with it is campuses are taking a portion of that and, and using it to create revolving loan funds for deferred maintenance and capital renewal. Uh, so you know, no one's going to have the project out for 100 years, but they can have it out for you know, eight years or 12 years and then keep recycling it itself. And then they, don't, you know, they basically just have to pay the interest on it because the, the principal is so, um, uh, is so long dated. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but this, you know, our debt has serious constraints. And um, uh, it's one of the things that is going to be, um, uh, you know, come a, a real challenge in the, in the coming years. Uh, this is another area that we have um, uh, 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 really optimized, is looking at our, our um, uh, financial assets. So the endowments you know, have grown um, uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, so right now, between the uh, Regents Endowment and the Campus Foundations, we have about uh, $15 um, uh, billion dollars of endowment. Uh, that's, that's great, though you know, we have 250,000 students. So you know, the math on that is 60,000 across the whole system, $60,000 uh, of endowment per student. You know, when uh, Stanford has 1.2 million. Uh, so this is an area that we need to grow. We, uh, when I first joined the university, all we had was STIP. Uh, and STIP is our short-term investment pool. It's in, invested entirely for uh, safety, for liquidity. Uh, you, you, you know, we had 24-hour notice on being able to uh, withdraw it. Uh, it was great, but it only returned 1.6%. Uh, in 2008, we launched TRIP, it's called the Total Return uh, Investment Pool. Um, and um, uh, the first, we, we launched it in August of 2008, and if anyone remembers that, it was probably the absolute worst time to, and I think we actually lost money in the first six months. And, uh, um, but since that time, uh, over the last seven years, uh, it has averaged 8.3%. So 7% uh, more than, uh, than STIP. And when you think about that on a, on a billion dollars, that was $70 million. It really helped us withstand a lot during the, the financial crisis. We have since uh, taken a lot of the chips off the table. We've de-risked it. But it's still meant to earn about 3% uh, more, uh, 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 more than STIP. And this is something we're trying to move as much as we can from STIP into, into TRIP. And then if there are excess earnings, move it into GEP. Because that's, that's what will give us long-term uh, resilience, is getting more money into endowment and more unrestricted money into um, uh, into endowment. Nathan, did you de-risk it on a short-term basis or permanently? Or permanently, yeah. What, what happened, John, is that we had just had, we, it started with 50% fixed income, 25% equities, but there was just such a run-up in equities that we weren't, it just naturally, uh, and, then, and so just this uh, summer we, um, uh, we took it down to our original allocation. 
Um, and then this is another thing that we did this summer. Uh, this is a very busy chart, hard to, hard to read. But you know, as is typical, when we first introduced um, uh, TRIP, uh, you know, who immediately jumped in? UCSF, UCLA, and Berkeley. You know, and they put as much as they could in. And it was the smaller campuses. This is not, it used to be that they were all up here. Uh, and they had real reasons to not do it because they had absolute liquidity needs. It wasn't just relative. So uh, what we did is we said we would guarantee liquidity system-wide. And that, um, that has enabled every campus to move down. So, I mean, Riverside's gone a little crazy with it. They're down to 13% um, uh, uh, step now. But this is something, you know, we're able to use this broad pool to guarantee system-wide uh, liquidity, enable every campus, uh, and not just the big ones, to move as far down in, in um, uh, step as they, uh, as they want. Um, this is another area that we've, that we've used our, our, uh, our balance sheet, and uh, I think uh, uh, quite effectively. Uh, we had a very, very dramatic decline in um, uh, uh, UCRP, our pension plan. Uh, it had gone from overfunding to down, it got to uh, as low as 72% uh, at, at our lowest. Uh, we uh, did several things. We restarted uh, contributions. Uh, they are now fully implemented, so employees pay on the old tier, pay 8%, and um, university pays uh, 14%. We had very strong investment returns, as I had mentioned. But the other thing we did is we did um, additional borrowing. You know, I mentioned that STIP had excess liquidity um, and was earning about 1.5%. Our pension uh, is projected to earn 7.5%. And so we have borrowed on four different occasions uh, an amount totaling $2.7 billion and put it into to UCRP. And so on any given year, uh, that's, you know, if it's a 6% arbitrage on $3 billion, uh, that will um, generate $180 million that stays in uh, uh, UCRP. Uh, so I'm bringing to the Regents next week um, a proposal to do three additional years of borrowing, which we're going to do. This was the money that we are, are getting from the state. I mentioned the $436 million. I'll borrow the, the, the rest, and that'll accelerate our time to, uh, to get to, to uh, full funding. Right now, we're projected to get to 90% funding by 2025. Um, and um, uh, that's, you know, that's a pretty good target to, to get to. Any, people look perplexed. Pat, yeah. Um, I remember several years ago when the um, stability and future of UCRT was considered a major problem. Are you saying that it is no longer considered a major problem? Uh, no, it's a problem. Uh, I mean, no, no, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's, it's very stable. It's, uh, but, um, uh, and, and we're on trajectory uh, uh, to grow, and we're doing a lot of things to shore it up. But it's a huge problem from our operating budget. You know, 14% on our covered comp of, you know, uh, close to $10 billion is, it's about $1.3, $1.4 billion a year that we're paying out of our operating budget that six years ago we didn't have to pay. And so it's, you know, uh, when you think about all the other things that we could be spending it on, uh, it, it is, a, even if we just paid the normal costs, it would be about 8%. So that would be a lot of uh, excess money. So I think we're doing the right thing, but it's, you know, I wish, I wish we'd started a little bit earlier, I guess. Is, just one follow-up question. Do you think there's any prospect that the state will resume its contributions because it has saved billions of dollars because uh, UC is taking charge of its own uh, UCRP? Um, it's a very good question. I mean, I think, the, I think this was a good start, getting the one-time money. Um, the, um, you know, then the other thing they used to always raise is, well, you have a different pension uh, system. You don't adopt our cap. You know, we're looking at doing a, a DB with the, their cap. Their arguments start to uh, uh, fall through. I just don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to have the money. Uh, but it is, uh, as Pat points out, it is a big difference between us and Cal State, between us and the community colleges, is they get all their pension contributions paid directly by the state. We have to do this all out of our own, uh, out of our own resources. Yeah. Celeste, yeah. Um, about sustainability, what guarantees that the state will give us the 170 million in 2017, 2018, not in the budget? It will be in the, it will be in the governor's budget. But it hasn't been approved by the legislature. That's right, yeah. And the legislature reminds me of that every time. <laughs> that, yeah. So you know, it's not yeah. like the legislature has never before overridden a, a governor's comment. Yeah, I think this one would be uh, uh, unlikely. I mean, it's not, it's not, it could happen. Um, and, you know, the speaker has said that several times, that your framework is with the governor. But, you know, it, it, first of all, it's not out of the general fund. 
it's out of Prop 2. So it doesn't affect any of the other programs. It has to be spent on unfunded um, uh, liabilities. Um, so I think it would be, um, I think it would be really tough for them to, uh, uh, to reverse it. Um, and in fact, I plan to try to get more. Because there is, it's Prop 2 money that's going to keep recurring. Uh, and there's no reason once we're in that we shouldn't you know, continue to get that. And that will, uh, because the other thing about this is that you know, I, I, I showed you we had about $6 billion of liquidity. We can't keep borrowing like this, or we, or we really jeopardize our short-term liquidity. So um, uh, the more we can get in state contributions, the, the quicker we'll get to reducing our, our contribution. Um, we also have a new chief investment officer, and uh, he's, a, he, he's a, a wonderful addition, uh, Jagdeep uh, uh, Bacher. And one of the things he did is when he came is he looked um, and he said, he said, why aren't we investing more in UC? And I said, well, you know, it's just we haven't, haven't looked at it that way. So we've started to work on, on several things. He's looking at a number of our energy projects um, and taking investments uh, there. Uh, he's done a lot in direct real estate. Um, he bought a... Uh, uh, he bought a student uh, housing complex in the middle of Isla Vista. <laughs> a brave man. <laughs> uh, um, uh, he bought his own building, uh, 1111 Broadway. Uh, he uh, bought the hotel that's on the uh, UC Davis property. He's also looking at development. We've actually been meeting with, um, uh, with Rose and her colleagues at looking at uh, you know, student housing. Um, uh, I mean, his point was they're invested in student housing across the country. Why are we invested in our own, uh, our own um, uh, operations? And it really is, it, it's going to go a long way to, to help us, especially with the, the debt capacity constraints that I was, I was talking about. One of the other things that he's done is looking at ways that and he says, you know, we have the most uh, amazing environment for uh, technology and innovation. Uh, why aren't we investing more directly? And so he started this UC Ventures program. Uh, which is going to invest in, uh, first of all, a lot of local funds. So, um, you know, San Francisco, Berkeley, uh, Davis all have local funds looking at doing seed and angel funds for, uh, uh, you know, for innovations that come off the campus. Then he's going to also look at doing a venture capital fund and then, and then getting some of his existing portfolio to invest in that. And the idea is not only to look at, you know, potential returns for our investments, but also to support our, our professors. Uh, and making sure that they can keep the, um, uh, the technology in play um, uh, uh, longer. Um, so I want to spend a little time on administrative efficiencies, but um, I'm going to really focus on, on a, on a system-wide level. Um, every campus has you know, something going on looking at um, uh, you know, what they can do to reduce uh, uh, costs on the, on the campuses. There are also some remarkable uh, regional um, uh, things going on. You know, UCLA running financials for, uh, for Merced and other, um, uh, other campuses, Berkeley and San Francisco combining their, their procurement offices. The ones I'm going to look at are ones that really uh, leverage the size and scale of UC. You know, we have 250,000 students, uh, nearly 150,000 faculty and, and staff. Uh, that's tremendous buying power. That's tremendous uh, leverage that we have in all of our, our contracts. And that's the kind of thing that we need to focus on um, uh, system-wide. So the first one is procurement. And um, I point this out because it's been, first of all, it's been incredibly successful, um, uh, you know, both from the financial and also the, uh, the technology perspective. But I, 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 I want to start with it because it really also has uh, engendered a new um, governance and operational model. Uh, so rather than setting up a big uh, uh, procurement infrastructure in, in Oakland uh, at OP and having it all centrally located, uh, what our procurement officer, uh, Bill Cooper, did is that he set it up system-wide. So he has a fairly small staff in, in Oakland, and then he has centers of excellence across all the campuses. So life sciences is at, at San Diego. Uh, D uh, Davis has uh, IT. What do, you, what do you have here, Rose? I can't remember. Is there a... Um, but, and, and so those people have both the ownership and the, um, uh, you know, the, the stewardship of those parts of it. And it really has done wonders at making it a, much more of a uh, UC-wide procurement rather than a, you know, a, a, an OP-directed. Um, and, and frankly, it's, it's the kind of governance model I think we should be using on all of our uh, administrative um, uh, practices. Um, energy efficiency, we've done um, uh, incredibly well because we have... Uh, We've had this uh, uh, partnership with the um, uh, investor-owned utilities for the last decade where they will give a portion of equity for uh, energy efficiency that we've matched with some of our debt. 
So it's led to a lot of financial savings in terms of reducing our, our energy costs. Uh, and, and quite frankly, in a time when the state has not been funding uh, capital or, or deferred maintenance, we've used it to do a lot of deferred maintenance. So if you're putting in a new HVAC system because it's more efficient and will reduce your energy, it's also a new HVAC system, which we would have had to do out of some funds uh, anyway. So it's, uh, this is one we're actually negotiating with the IOUs to, um, to extend it and, and increase it uh, uh, now. Um, about three years ago, we launched uh, a, a captive insurance company, uh, Fiat Lux. And uh, um, this has been um, uh, uh, very helpful. What it really does is before we had Fiat Lux, we bought almost all of our insurance commercially. And so we paid a lot in, in, in premiums, whether it's for workers' comp or uh, medical malpractice or general liability. Uh, and we didn't take a lot in, in, in self-insurance or in, in reinsurance. So because we have a captive insurance uh, company now, we're able to enter the reinsurance market. We benefit um, uh, from that. We're entering, we're also able to cross collateralize so we can, have, we can keep lower reserves than before when we had all these different silos. And we're looking at, at moving into different areas of, of, of coverage. So medical malpractice for uh, affiliated physicians is one area that we are um, uh, uh, doing. Uh, we're offering renter's insurance to, um, uh, to our students, uh, which was you know, previously they had to do um, uh, commercially. Gives us a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of opportunity both for more insurance and also uh, less costly uh, insurance. Uh, and then finally, you know, and, and uh, a year ago, this would have got as many hisses as Stanford, but I'm, I'm very proud of this uh, 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 right now, is, is UC Path. And UC Path, for those who don't know, is our system-wide uh, payroll, academic personnel, timekeeping, and, and HR system. And um, I've been with it uh, present since the creation, uh, and it was fraught with lots and lots of problems. Um, and I would say probably the main problem that we didn't recognize is that uh, a new payroll system is not a technology project. Um, you, know, you can use technology to, to uh, enhance it, but it's primarily about business processes. It's primarily about uh, standardization. And until we, until we are able to pivot and realize that you know, until we could come up with uh, standard business processes, standard business definitions, this was going nowhere. Uh, we did that, and actually, I am proud to say that as of right now, we are in flight. Uh, my paycheck, hopefully, will be coming from UC Path this uh, November 30th. Uh, <laughs> no, it's. <a laughs> Or we're going to have a very sad Christmas around. The <laughs> uh, but this is, um, uh, you know, under the, under the current plan, we have three waves. So we're going out this November. Uh, then next year, we'll have UCLA, Riverside, uh, and Merced. Um, and then the, 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 the following two waves, by early 2018, uh, this should be um, live across the, uh, the system. And, you know, the hope is, is that it's going to be uh, a better service quality. And then over time, I mean, I, I, I don't see it as immediate, like out of the gate cost savings, but over time, I think it has the ability to not only reduce our administrative costs, but also serve as a springboard. I mean, we're going to have a, a shared service center. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for so many different things that we do. Uh, you know, you could do travel expenses. You could do student payments. You could do all sorts of things uh, uh, that we currently do campus by campus, and you could do it uh, collectively. Okay, and I told Steve that I, uh, I had to throw in some, uh, my, my kids know me as a perennial optimist, uh, and so I have to show, th throw in some of these uh, challenges, many of which we've, um, we, we have touched on. Um, the first one, and I, I did touch on this earlier, is, uh, is capital. Um, this is another area, we talk about the billion dollar cuts from the state in the operating budget, but we've got no capital from the state in you know, nearly as long. Um, the last uh, general obligation bond that the uh, uh, state passed for UC was in 2006. Uh, I think the last lease revenue bonds were 2011. Uh, so everything else that we have done, both in new capital and also in, in deferred maintenance and, and capital renewal, has been on our own dime, on our own uh, 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 balance sheet. Um, and you know, I'm hopeful that at some point we'll get another uh, GO. But I don't think the state's ever going to come back um, and, uh, and fund capital the way they did um, you know, 50 years ago. And we're feeling it right now because um, uh, we are trying to um, uh, build out Merced. And you know, when, uh, when Irvine, when Santa Cruz um, uh, were built, it was almost entirely done by state dollars. And with Merced, we're doing it entirely on, on UC resources. Um, uh, so you know, this, is a, um, uh, you know, this is a big challenge. 
we are we are trying to manage it. We are um, uh, you know moving from um, uh, where we're going to ask every project to actually show that they have a, a P and L. It used to be that they could issue bonds just based on the overall strength, but every every project and every campus is going to have to show that they are that can support this. Uh, I talked about the different uh, credit structure. Uh, right now, all of our liens are in the AA credit, which is very, very high. Um, I think it's very, it's important that the UC, the University of California, the general credit be a AA credit, but I don't necessarily need AA rated parking garages. And we can get a lot more capacity uh, for dormitories, for parking garages, for other income producing if we move further down on the, on the credit spectrum. And then we're also using um, other types of, um, uh, of financing structures uh, for projects. The biggest one right now is Merced 2020. Uh, that is a, uh, it's a private public partnership. We're going to the Regents next week to get the, um, to release the RFP. But basically it is doing, um, we've done design build projects before, we've done design build finance. This is going to be a design, build, finance, operate, and maintain with private partners. And so it is, um, you know, it's been done a lot, but generally on smaller projects, this is probably the biggest um, uh, that's done in sort of the social infrastructure uh, space. It's done quite a bit for transportation projects around the country and, uh, and especially in, in, in Europe. Uh, I mentioned UCRP. Again, I think. I think we have turned the corner uh, on, on UCRP's um, uh, uh, funding, but it's still going to take a big part of our, our, bu our budget. This is an area that we haven't uh, done much on. And um, you know, it's a gaudy uh, unfunded liability, $17 billion in retiree health. Uh, I will tell you it's a little bit, that's a little bit of an accounting artifice. Um, because we don't pre-fund it, uh, we have to discount our liabilities at a very low discount rate. We discount it at, I think, 4%. Uh, where you know with UCRP we discounted at seven and a, a quarter percent, so it's it's overstated, but it's one that we are going to um, uh, have to uh, look at pretty uh, uh, carefully. The other thing I would note is that a lot of our competitors, you know, um, uh, in higher ed don't have a DB, and so uh, because they have a DC, they have the outlay from the operating budget, but they don't have unfunded liability. Many of them do not provide um, uh, OPEB uh, either, so it is a, a, a challenge to us in the in the competitive. Uh, environment. And then this is one that I think, you know, I alluded to at the, at the beginning, but this is, uh, it's coming from several uh, different sources. This was actually in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, it's sort of saying that higher education is a little bit of a microcosm of uh, society and that, you know, the, 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 the rich are really um, uh, uh, getting richer. And so this is looking at the uh, top 20 universities in the, in the country in terms of their overall wealth. Um, you know, I'd say that uh, UC, it's listed as four here. That's, that's misleading. It's misleading for a, um, uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, one is um, about half that wealth is in working capital, uh, the trip and stip that I, I talked about, and we need that to support our medical centers. So it's not really um, uh, the equivalent. And then you have to just look at our size. You know, uh, we have 250,000 students. Uh, Yale might be a tenth of that. Princeton is, uh, is, is about 15,000 uh, students. So if you looked at it on a per student basis, all of these publics would lag the uh, the privates, and you know, at the same time, Harvard and Stanford, even though they have those those um, uh, uh, those assets, each raised over a billion dollars last year. So it's um, uh, it's big and it's and it's growing. And this is something I started when I was at Berkeley, and I just resurrected it for this this slide deck. Is what I did is I took um, uh, the combination of endowment payout from some of the top competitors: Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, Princeton. Um, and I compared it to uh, Berkeley, both the endowment payout and state funds. So it's the equivalent of sort of grossing up uh, uh, the state appropriation into uh, uh, an endowment and seeing how that compared. So you can see as recently as, as 2001, it was very, very competitive. This yellow is, is, is um, uh, Berkeley. It actually stayed fairly competitive into the um, uh, fiscal crisis. But with the cuts from the state, you know, they had a little bit of downturn because of the market uh, uh, corrections. Uh, you can see it, it now it lags well behind. And if you did this on a per student basis, it would lag uh, uh, way behind. And then the other thing that, that I think is a huge challenge about this is that you know, at the beginning I was talking about growth in the 4% range on, our, you know, on, on, on the state or on tuition. You know, these are projected to grow at 7.5%, 8, 8.5% uh, uh, every year. And so you can see a situation where especially the uh, you know, the real elite privates where the, um, uh, the gulf just continued to grow 
with the, the top public universities. And again, this is not just Berkeley. This is very similar to at, 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 at UCLA, at, at Virginia, at Texas, at, at Michigan. Uh, it is a big concern, the, the, the growing gulf between the, the top publics and the top private um, uh, universities. But I can't by my nature uh, end on a sour note. So I'm going to turn back to. <laughs> So this is our strategy, and, and I do think, uh, I, I think the one thing I would say is um, um, there was a great talk by, I think he's an a, a economist at MIT about climate change, and you know, they, they show the trajectory of climate change and, and um, uh, the, um, how much warmer the, the globe is going to get. And then he does these wedges, and there's like you know, 18 or 19 wedges in order to keep it flat and not lead to the, you know, the, the two degree um, uh, growth that's going to uh, imperil us all. Um, and each of those is a, is a measure that we have to take. And I sort of feel that way about, about the university, is that we have, you know, there are 18 or 20 or 22 different um, uh, things we need to do. And if we execute against all of them, we will have a, a solid and, and sustainable uh, funding model. But it's not, there's no silver bullet. We can't just pick or choose uh, uh, which one there, uh, uh, there is. So, um, with that, I will um, uh, open it up for questions or discussion or, oh, I used a, a Santa Cruz uh, mascot. <laughs> Where's, it's supposed to be Oski there. <laughs> Celeste, yeah. Um, so I guess what concerned me most was when you were talking about the new, um, I forget what his name was, uh, the investment officer. Uh -huh. uh, and the question is, why aren't we invested in our own operations? And it sounds good on the face of it, but when I think about issues that could occur, for example, we own dormitories. Yeah. We want to raise um, fees yeah. for rent, and, and so we are opposed to our students. We, want, we say, well, we need those cost recoveries to fund these other things, et cetera. So that's, yeah. a, that's an ethical problem. And you can see the same thing happening with investment in certain um, scientific or technological inventions. That is, we are now invested in... Um, arguing for its benefit and its, um, you know, that it does what it says it will do, um, and that could potentially lead the public to regard the university as as no longer a trustworthy, um, uh, you know, student of these technologies or inventions. Yeah, um, good, very good questions, and, and two different answers. I mean, first of all, the one on student housing is a very is a very real one, and he and I have talked about that, and you probably want to do it in a um, uh, you know, in arm's length, you know, have a separate organization that would um, uh, that would look at that because um, uh, you know he is he is charged with fiduciary returns, and so if he were to put that into pension, you know that that is something that um, uh, and you know student housing is probably one that won't happen right away because there's lots of pools of capital for it um, right now, you know, outside of the, the the university. But he you know they they do own student housing in other parts of the country. And so he was looking at, well, why, would, why wouldn't we look at you know, projects that are either part of a campus or, part, or affiliated with a campus in the, in the UC system? Uh, and on the, on the ventures and technology, he is going to set that up again in a, um, uh, he's going to have a separate board that uh, uh, evaluates every single uh, uh, project. You know, it won't be influenced by you know, campus politics or by, um, uh, you know, by, the, by the scientific community. It'll be, a, in essence, a you know, venture capital uh, fund that you know, just happens to be owned or, or uh, partially owned by the, um, uh, the university. So it, it, it's really just trying to get more money into the you know, university ecosystem at an, earlier, uh, uh, at an earlier time. And again, I would point out that a lot of it is gonna, he's going to be investing directly in funds that already exist. Like you know, QB3 has uh, two funds right now investing, and they could use more capital. So part of it's going to be uh, investing in there. But he actually would be a good person to have come talk to this group because he's got some really visionary things for, um, uh, for the university. Yeah. Yeah, there's one thing you didn't mention. Um, is, ah, thanks. Um, is expansion of administrative, or well, senior managers, I believe they're called, right? And which there are probably a few here. Um, and at the system-wide level, it's, over the last 20 years, it's increased about four times, and at Berkeley, it's increased five times. Um, what is your understanding of this? Uh, from below, it seems that though this is a, uh, an interesting place where one could actually cut. I mean, how does one explain this 
enormous yeah. expansion. Well, it, um, uh, first of all, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the senior managers, uh, because I've, I've had to testify a lot on this at the, at the legislature. And you know, when it's, we- is this, this is data from UCOP. Yeah, yeah. It's, a senior, it's, it's the category senior manager that UCOP uses. Okay. I can, I've got the figures here yeah. if you want. To the, um, but you know, if you look at over the last 15 years, there has been a lot of growth in, in, in management. Uh, most of that has actually happened uh, in two different areas. Uh, one on the medical center side, you know, if you think of the revenues of the medical centers, you know, nearly doubling uh, during that time, that has taken a lot of, uh, 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 you know, additional administrative uh, need. And then also on, on research. I mean, research has, has grown um, dramatically. So when the legislature does it, they usually do it against the number of students or the number of faculty. It doesn't take into account the, you know, the growth of the, uh, uh, the rest of the enterprise that's taken place. Well, there's no medical center here, and it's grown even bigger here than it is system-wide. Okay, I, I don't know the I don't know the specific numbers here, but I would also I, I think research has grown quite a bit on the on, on the Berkeley campus. So. Yeah, Steve. So again, with my myopic con myopic focus on on Berkeley, uh, we're currently running supposedly a hundred uh, hundred and fifty million a year structural deficit, and I'm just wondering, you know, what the vision is from Oakland about how we're going to get through this. Do, do would you? Uh, Care to comment off the record? Yeah, <laughs> or no, even? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or even on the record, then. <laughs> we had one of our regents who said, "I'd never say this in public at a public meeting." I will just say that uh, I think that the I think that the team and 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 Rose has been um, uh, you know front and center have put together some really um, uh, innovative plans on, uh, on addressing it. Uh, I do think it's one that takes, is gonna take several years uh, to work through. And so we are looking at uh, trying to support it through you know, commercial paper, through internal lines of credit, possibly restructuring uh, some debt in order to, uh, you know, to, to make it a, um, more of a glide path because uh, you know, cutting that much out of a, a budget in one year um, you know, can have some unintended uh, uh, consequences. Fair enough. Yeah. So when you're talking about the UCOP model uh, in terms of increasing revenue uh, and the efficiencies you're seeing with UCPath and some of these other things, I feel, much as I did 20 plus years ago on this campus, that everybody's reinventing the wheel in their individual silo. One of the things we're recently finding is uh, the public policy school is launching a self-supporting degree program mm -hmm. and the obstacles administratively and policy wise including up to UCOP approvals for certain things that are not in fact state funded and regential approvals for things that will not be state funded um, I think are real barriers for mm. allowing these things to continue to have some traction and not just at Berkeley but perhaps at other universities uh, within the UC system. So I was wondering if that's even on the radar screen at UCOP and whether there's any sort of packaging that can be done so hey you Riverside want to do yeah. you know a strategic model here we can help you with this is what you need to put in place for revenue this is what you need to put in place for financial aid and really help guide some of these eventually they're they're feeling like startups yeah, yeah. Uh, and just wondering if UCOP is looking at that as something that they can assist with yeah I mean uh, well, a couple of things I mean first of all in terms of the administrative barriers I, I um, uh, you know, I share your con concern, and I think you know some of it is also being a, just a cultural shift mm -hmm. of one where um, uh, you know, 20 years ago there were lots of uh, reports being done for the state, you know, lots of uh, you know concern about state standards on buildings and things, and and why are we doing that? You know, I mean, no, I, I'm I'm serious. You know, it's yeah. what, what you know it, with Merced, everyone's saying, well, what, are we meeting the state standards? It's like, I mean, we we. We're building the best buildings for uh, for Merced. We're not going to go with uh, CPAC, which ended five years ago. We're not going to go with their 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 classroom um, uh, standards. Um, and we're trying to uh, uh, become, you know, uh, uh, less oversight and more uh, in entrepreneurial. Um, the uh, the president uh, asked me to and and Rachel Nava, the new COO, to look at you know what she calls a four eyes initiative. It's like, you know, why. Do you need more than four eyes to look at something before it gets <laughs> before it gets moved on? No, and it's a good it's, it's a good a question. question. Yeah. I mean, you know, quite honestly, if I'm the twelfth person reviewing, I don't review it very carefully. If I'm the second person, 
I'll you know take it home and read it, read it, read it pretty carefully. But uh, I do think that we also, um, I think this is one where you know when I talk about the governance of uh, procurement. I think this is one where um, uh, uh, system wide we can draw on other campuses. Uh, you know something that's doing doing really well here at Berkeley might be um, applicable at Riverside or or Santa Barbara. And, um, and we're uh, really bad at leveraging that. No, and, and I, I mean, I, I think we're getting a lot better. Yeah. We're certainly a lot better than when I was on, on campus, but you know, Rose leads the, the CFO group, and they're much more collaborative and um, you know, sharing all sorts of ideas. And um, uh, so I, th I, think it, I think we're moving into an age where everyone realizes that we're going to have to uh, take on all of these, um, uh, all these things. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned earlier uh, that, that the president was considering accelerating the rebinging program. Is that? Does that mean, uh -huh. Yeah, does that mean that, that they're going to be using a larger portion? Of, as I understand, you take a portion of this general fund and give it to some of the campuses that have less per FTE funding. Does that mean that there's going to be a larger portion of it? Or what does Accelerate yeah. that program mean? Yeah, so uh, let me rebenching um, it was an uh, effort we started. Um, uh, we had a system-wide uh, work group uh, that looked at... Um, it, it went in, it, it had two parts to it. The first was called funding streams, which said that everything that's generated on a campus stays on a campus. Yeah. And so all non-resident tuition, all indirect cost recovery, all private philanthropy, everything that Berkeley generates would stay uh, on that campus. But then in addition, we looked at some of the uh, inequities between state funding mm -hmm. per student mm -hmm. uh, and on a weighted basis. And you know, the weighting we came up with, you, know, you can argue with, but you know, it was, it was one for an undergraduate, two and a half for an uh, academic um, master's, mm -hmm. and uh, five for health sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we came up with the weighting. And it turned out that, you know, there was quite a bit of disparity. The highest was UCLA. Mm -hmm. uh, the lowest was Santa Barbara. Uh, if you were an undergraduate at Santa Barbara, you got about $2,000 less in state funding every year than, um, uh, than UCLA. And so, uh, you know, again, we didn't want to um, be disruptive to any uh, single campus, and so we, we agreed to do it over a six-year uh, period. It turned out it took about $37 million of state funds uh, every year. So if we got, you know, $150 million, $37 would be would go to uh, rebenching, which meant that UCLA would get zero of that, and then based on where you were in the waterfall, you would get, you would get more and more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the president decided that instead of uh, it was supposed to be through... Uh, uh, 1718, we would do it through 1617. Uh, and so we're taking the last two years. So it is a greater chunk of state appropriations that are going into that, that amount. But, but, so before that plan, then there was all of that was pooled and then redistributed. And then, yeah. And then that's so that plan let the campuses sort of keep their research and out of state. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, Let's thank Nathan for it.